This is episode five of Jonah, chapter four. And here's Jonah over here. He's a contemporary of Amos and Hosea. The three of them are preaching to the northern kingdom. So here we have King Saul, David, and Solomon. And under them, under David and Solomon was the united kingdom. And then uh, when Solomon died and his son took over, it split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was Israel. Southern was called Judah. And Jonah, Amos, and Hosea are warning the northern kingdom, Israel, that uh, if they don't behave themselves, the Assyrians will take them into captivity. So he was a contemporary up here. And the Assyrian Empire was the enemy of the northern kingdom and Israel's greatest threat. Jonah was tasked with warning Nineveh, their capital city, the Assyrian capital city, to repent of their wickedness. The layout of Jonah illustrates the key theme, the relentless love of God. Chapter 1 was Jonah's disobedience and God's patience with him, with the storm at sea, thrown into the sea, and his prayer. Chapter 2 was God answers Jonah's prayer, God's mercy towards Jonah, Jonah's salvation, and he's vomited onto dry land. Chapter 3, Jonah preaches to Nineveh, God's power through Jonah, because the people of Nineveh believe, and the entire city of millions goes down to their knees in sackcloth and ashes. And now we're on the final chapter 4, Jonah's displeasure and God's ministry to Jonah. Jonah's vine, shelter, dies, and God's mercy is revealed. So let's dive into chapter 4. Jonah is angry and God is mercy. Repeating chapter 3, the final verse, Then God saw their works, that they, Nineveh, turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The vine, the worm, and the east wind. Why is this chapter even here, chapter 4? The first three chapters are a neat package. Jonah runs, Jonah is forcibly returned, and Nineveh repents from the king on down. This would have been a happily ever after story, with all the loose ends tied up. And Jonah would have gone down as the greatest Old Testament prophet, with one to two million people repentant at one time. So why chapter 4? Because the Bible tells the full story, warts and all, and Jonah had many faults. Outwardly was doing what God called him to do, but inwardly he was far removed from the purposes of God and from a godly character. Jonah was thinking according to his own selfish will, according to what he felt was right in his own eyes. He had no compassion for the lost city. The main objective of the book of Jonah is still ahead. We, and Jonah, need to think of God as sovereign and to want to bring about a kingdom experience for all who want to be saved. We must learn to love others as Jesus Christ loves us. Jesus is the only person who strides through history without weakness or faults. Verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. But here we are back to the butts like we had in chapter 1. When God stops being angry, Jonah starts. God was angry at the wickedness of the city of Nineveh with its violence, immorality, injustice, and idolatry. God's anger stopped when the city repented. Jonah was thrilled to deliver God's message of judgment, but now he is angry because God redeemed these same people and saved them. Jonah felt that God is too kind, too merciful, too forgiving, too slow to anger, and too compassionate. Jonah would have preferred a more violent God when it suits Jonah. Otherwise, for himself, he was grateful for the fish. Jonah has a pity party, standing there in the presence of Almighty God, pouting. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. So here's Jonah, selfish, sullen, and angry. He endured a horrendous storm at sea, got tossed overboard, was swallowed by a fish, sat in Hades, was vomited out back where he started, and very disgruntled, he marched all the way to Nineveh to hammer home God's message of judgment. And the city repented. So then what happened? God relented and didn't wipe out the city. It was spared. This was not the result Jonah had in mind. He was hoping that after 40 days, God would wipe them off the map. That's what he really wanted. We often cry for justice on someone else. For ourselves, we want mercy. The heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. Isn't that true? Jonah's problem is his heart. His message was one of damnation. In 40 days, you're all toast. He didn't give them any hope. 
but they grabbed onto hope anyway. They all repented, and God relented. Jonah knew that was always a possibility, and that's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So he prayed to the Lord. Jonah is complaining bitterly to God. He's very critical of God's behavior. He isn't really praying. He's lecturing God. He says, I knew it, I knew it. You have spared Israel's greatest enemy. Now we hear the real reason why he fled to the other end of the known world. He knew God was gracious and merciful, and he didn't want the Ninevites to be on the receiving end of this mercy. He forgets that because God is a merciful God, Jonah wasn't left to rot in Hades until judgment day. Instead, God resurrected him and sent a great fish to rescue him, to redeem him. Jonah is not a happy camper. He prayed his best prayer alone in the belly of the fish, and he prayed his worst prayer outside Nineveh. And we have all prayed like that. God, I asked for this, and you gave me that. I wanted to go there, and you sent me here. Often we are happy to obey God's will, but only when it gels with our own. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. Please take my life. And he's melodramatic. What John is really saying is, I did what you wanted, now you do what I want. Kill them. Jonah had spent 40 days telling the people of the city that they were toast, and here it was the 41st day and nothing bad happened to the city. Jonah would rather die than see his enemies receive mercy. Israel was a vassal state of the Assyrian Empire and paid expensive tributes and taxes to them whenever they demanded it, which was often. The wealthy northern kingdom was being bled dry by the Assyrian demands. So Jonah thoroughly disliked the Assyrians, hated them really, and everything they stood for. He was disgusted with the zero outcome because Nineveh still retained its power and later down the line they could still come back and annihilate Israel. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Just a few decades later, in 722 BC, Assyria swallowed up Israel as quickly as the fish had swallowed Jonah. That's the bad news. The good news is that many Assyrians retained their faith in the one true God. And when Jesus came to save the world, the remnant eagerly accepted Jesus as Messiah, became Christians, and there are still Assyrian churches today. There's even one in Arizona. Verse 4. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? God is very gentle with his sulking prophet. Examine your heart. Why are you really angry? Jonah had a deep loathing for these people. The Ninevites were easy to hate, as we saw in previous chapters. They loved torturing people. Mass executions filled them. They were proud of their utter cruelty and carved it into the walls for all to see. As far as Jonah was concerned, they deserved no mercy. Jonah lacked an understanding of the depth of God's love for his creation. His heart was way out of sync with the heart of God. He devalued the awesome grace that God had shown him personally. What made Jonah think he was deserving of God's grace, but the Ninevites were not? Jonah definitely was not a do unto others as you would like to be done by kind of guy. Verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. This is the second time that Jonah abandoned his divine assignment. He reluctantly delivered God's message and then fled his post. He could have stayed in the city, preached to the people, taught them about his loving God and how to worship the one true God, but instead he deserted the Ninevites. Jonah had just had the most successful revival ever. An entire city went to their knees in sackcloth and ashes and acknowledged the one true God. Yet Jonah is sulking. Sat on the east side. Biblically, the east is related to judgment. Although it was the 41st day, Jonah was still holding out hope that Nineveh would be destroyed. 
It's interesting that Jonah didn't sit on the river side of the city, just in case God sent a resounding flood on the 41st day. The Tigris River flooded often, so that was a possibility. But instead, Jonah made sure he sat far away on the east side, likely on a rise where he would have a good view of any impending destruction. He didn't want to be inadvertently caught up in God's justice on Nineveh, so he's way out of the city. There he made himself a shelter. Jonah could have just gone home after 40 days, but he wanted to stick around and watch. He knew it would be a hot day in the desert, so he came prepared with branches and leaves to build a shelter from the sun. He was more concerned with his own creature comforts than with a city of millions, till he might see what would become of the city. Jonah was still hoping that this pagan city would come to an abrupt end somehow, notwithstanding their heartfelt repentance. What did Jonah expect to see on day 41? That they would stop fasting and start partying again? Obviously he had high hopes that God would still decide to nuke them, and he wanted front row seats. <laughs> Aren't we just so much like that? Verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head, and deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. So Lord prepared the plant. Jonah's makeshift shelter shriveled with the heat of the midday sun, and Almighty God took pity on his rebellious prophet, sweltering under his withered shelter. <laughs> I love this. Just as God prepared a storm, and then a fish when it suited him, now God prepared a luxuriant plant that grew and shaded Jonah. God graciously increased the comfort of his stubborn, defiant prophet. Our great God who takes care of all things great and small is intimately aware of everything that affects us. I'm always touched that God knows every hair on my head. Luke 12, 7, Jesus said, But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. I interpret this to mean that since the day I was born till today, God knows that I have had, say, 15,264,770 hairs grown and lost to date. Now multiply that by billions of people, and God has numbered all the hairs on all our heads, and he keeps count. What a mighty God we serve. And then if you take men, I mean, their hair grows on their face. I mean, God says all the hairs on your head are numbered. So if you take this as your whole head... God even knows how many beards and moustaches and stuff came out on a man. Fortunately, we don't have that problem. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. The belief is this was a type of castor bean plant that has huge leaves up to 18 inches wide and can grow 12 to 18 inches a day. And Jonah was very grateful for the refreshing shade. Someone once said this was God's way of cooling down his hot-headed prophet. Jonah was luxuriating in God's provision, yet he still didn't appreciate or even want to understand that God had extended that same provision to the people of Nineveh. Verse 7. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. Even the littlest worm obeys God, and now a worm kills his shade plant. Jonah was not comforted by the words of Job, nor of Jesus in Acts. Job 1, and the Lord said, Naked I came from a mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't feel that. In Acts 20, remember the words of our Lord Jesus, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Jonah definitely, pre <laughs> Jonah definitely preferred the receiving part. He liked the shade of the plant. He had pity for the vine that died but no compassion for a massive city that would perish without God with a loss of all souls. Jonah had been to Hades. You'd think he would relent and let go of his hatred. Hatred is a tough one to part from. Verse 8. And it happened when the sun rose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God prepared a vehement east wind. This is the second time that God sent a stormy wind. The east wind is off a hot and dry desert, and God made this wind especially scalding. Now Jonah is really hot and sweaty and angry. That's Jonah's point of view. From God's point of view, 
He's knocked Jonah down and picked him up again and again, but Jonah just won't learn. East is related to judgment, and Jonah on the east side of the city experienced just a small degree of God's judgment. A small degree. What is Jonah calling for? He wants God's wrath to pour out over millions of people. So God is giving Jonah just a small taste of judgment because Jonah doesn't realize what he's asking for over Nineveh. Similarly, Jesus rebuked James and John when they wanted to command fire to come down from heaven on the heads of the disrespectful Samaritans. Luke 9. But he, Jesus, turned and rebuked them, John and James, and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Similarly, God did not come to destroy the Ninevites, but to save them. Sun beat down so that he grew faint. This is the second time that Jonah passed out. In chapter 2, he also passed out in the belly of the fish. Seems God has to repeat his lessons over and over to his rebellious prophet, Jonah 2. Remember, we're in chapter 4 now. This is Jonah chapter 2. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. God brought Jonah to the point where he had no power in and of himself. He was dependent on God. When he cried out from Hades, Shul, only God could save him. How quickly Jonah forgot that lesson. It's better for me to die. The Ninevites, the vine, the worm, and the wind have all obeyed God, but not Jonah. When Jonah got tossed overboard, then he cried out to God to be saved. When he had the opportunity to die, he wanted to live. Now he has the opportunity to live, but he just wants to die. Jonah is never happy with his circumstances. He does not recall God's unfailing faithfulness. God was faithful when he cried out in a fish. God was faithful and listened to his prayer in Hades. God was faithful in sending a fish to spit him out on a beach alive. God has been faithful throughout the book of Jonah. Yet Jonah seems to have a very short memory. Everything and everyone has been moved by God's provision, but not Jonah. The Jews read the book of Jonah every year on the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur is the holiest fast day and most sacred day of the year when Jews are closest to God. They spend the day in synagogue praying for forgiveness and seeking God's mercy. The first Yom Kippur took place after the exodus from Egypt when they arrived at Mount Sinai and God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on the mountain. When Moses descended, he found the people worshipping a golden calf and smashed the two tablets in anger. Because the Israelites then repented, God forgave their sin of idolatry and gave Moses a second set of tablets. Once a year, the Old Testament high priest would enter the holies of holies and sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant and make atonement for all the people of Israel. And this is why this book is read on this day, because mostly we are more like Jonah than the Ninevites. Are we really quick to fast and repent? Do we really understand the judgment of God and respond appropriately to his warnings? Or are we a Jonah? When God teaches us a lesson, do we learn it, then quickly forget it? Do we not allow it to impact our lives in the future, but just continue to live our lives as we want? Perhaps we Gentiles should also have a tradition to spend a day in church, praying for forgiveness and seeking God's mercy. Repentance, death to sin, and life to obedience, Galatians 5.24. Perhaps we should spend a day in church. Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. Is it right for you to be angry? What right have you to be angry over an insignificant plant? But you don't care about a huge city full of people. God asks a second time, what right have you to be angry? This is God's perspective. It's right for me to be angry. This is Jonah's perspective. He says, yes, I'm angry and I just want to die. As far as he's concerned, the Ninevites are the problem. As far as God is concerned, Jonah's heart is the problem. And that's the point. Jonah couldn't see his own wickedness, his hatred. This is yet another example where Jonah doesn't want to respond to what God is saying. He's determined to not see things from God's point of view. He's dead set on getting God to see things from his own standpoint. 
he's totally out of sync with God's character. God loves all creation and all of mankind, the Israelites and the Gentiles. Romans 11, Paul says about the Jews, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Jonah is grumpy and getting grumpier. Someone once said, sometimes I wake up grumpy and sometimes I let him sleep a little longer. Verse 10, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. You have pity on a plant. Jonah mourned for the plant with its fleeting love span that lived and died in just one day. He was not personally invested in the plant in any way. He just received the benefit of its shade. God is illustrating to Jonah that he is personally invested in everything from plants to worms to the Ninevites. God gave the same message to Peter in Joppa when he was standing on the rooftop and God gave him a vision of clean and unclean food. The Jews considered the Gentiles unclean and God told Peter to go to a Roman centurion to preach salvation because what God has made clean is cleansed. And you can read the story in Acts 10. And Peter immediately obeyed and thanks to Peter's change of heart and change of behavior, the Gentiles found salvation. It's not an accident that in that same city, Joppa, Peter was obedient to God, whereas Jonah was fleeing from God. And Peter gladly took the message of Messiah to the Gentiles, whereas Jonah balked. Compare Peter's response to Jonah's, who refused to preach to a Gentile city and showed no compassion for Nineveh at all, even when they fasted and prayed and atoned for their sins in sackcloth and ashes. This is quite the indictment of Jonah. Prophet of God. Why is this book read every year on Yom Kippur? Because it's all about atonement. According to Hebrew tradition, it's on Yom Kippur that God decides each person's fate, deciding if they will live or die in the coming year. So Jews are predisposed to make amends and ask forgiveness for sins committed during the past year. But while atonement is good, redemption is better. Atonement simply covers sin, it doesn't remove it. Atonement simply keeps God's judgment at bay. Redemption, on the other hand, removes the necessity for God's judgment because redemption doesn't cover up sin, it wipes it away. And the fact that Assyrian churches still exist today shows the Ninevites were redeemed. Plant which came up in a night and perished in a night. God points out that Jonah cares more for something of fleeting value rather than the lifetime of a city. Wow. Verse 11. And should I not pity Nineveh, the, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? And should I not pity Nineveh? God has the last word, as it should be. God's last word to Jonah emphatically proclaimed his concern for every creature, both animal and man. And the Ninevites even covered the animals in sackcloth. God will stay his judgment to give everyone a chance to repent and draw near to him. You know, you really are repenting when you even cover your animals. God is holy. He punishes sin. This is a biblical principle. But God accepts our repentance. And this is also a biblical principle, our repentance. Ezekiel 33 says, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God wants to bring Jonah into a divine understanding, to see things from God's perspective. So God questions Jonah's callousness. Should I not pity Nineveh? When we pray, do we want to know God's thoughts? Ask why God does things the way he does them, or are we just trying to get our point of view across? We expect and want the merciful God. We definitely don't expect, nor do we want, Judgment Day. More than 120,000. 120,000. This number is significant. God is a God of details. Nothing is written by chance, nor recorded simply to fill a scroll. If a biblical author penned a number in his writing, he had reason to do so. 
The number 12 occurs 187 times in the Bible. Some say it occurs 200 plus times if you include its multiples like 2 times 12, 24, 12, 12, 144. There are the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses sent 12 spies into Canaan. There are 12 minor prophets. We're doing one of them. Jonah is a minor prophet. At 12 years old, Jesus was found preaching in the temple, and Jesus had 12 disciples. There are many other examples of 12, if you're interested in hunting them down, including 12 hours in a day and 12 hours at night. In Hebrew, 12 signifies God's perfect government, his divine order. God is in control, and the number 12 testifies to his divine authority and reign, to completeness and the perfection of his creation. And isn't it perfect? 12 is God's government on earth. The number 12 appears here for a reason, because 12 relates to Israel, the 12 tribes of God's chosen people, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left. God knew the city was wicked. That's why he sent Jonah in the first place. But God also knows that in that great city are 120,000 little children who aren't mature enough to know right from wrong. Another biblical principle is in the law of Moses. Deuteronomy 24, this biblical principle. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. But a person shall be put to death for his own sin. God created Israel purposefully to be a blessing and a light to other nations. And that is what Jonah was called to do. And he went, but so reluctantly, because he didn't want Nineveh to have any divine revelation of the one true God. Why? Because of his unwillingness to love his enemies. He was sorely lacking in a true understanding of God's grace, even though he had just experienced it himself so recently. The Hebrew perspective of not knowing right from left means there's no divine revelation. Ancient scholars speak of this as an indictment of Jonah in general and Israel in particular. Because why? Because Israel was created to be a blessing and a light to other nations. So why does Nineveh not know their right from left? Because Israel did not take the knowledge to them. There's no divine revelation. And much livestock with a question mark. Jonah and Nahum are the only two books in the Bible that end with a question. And both books have to do with the city of Nineveh. Nahum's book ends with a question about God's punishment of Nineveh. You can read that in Nahum 3. While Jonah's ends with a question about God's pity for the city. It's a strange way to end a book because you never find out how Jonah answered God's question. We are left to guess. Biblically speaking, livestock represents wealth and that which has great wealth has great potential. God is saying to Jonah, this city has great potential to be used by me to bring about great fruitfulness. But Jonah can't even find an ounce of pity, not even for dumb animals. God gave Nineveh 40 days to oblivion. Jonah understood this to mean a judgment day, a show of God's wrath. But God saw it as an opportunity to save and bless a city, and by extension, a nation, an empire, really. Remember, 40 means change, a testing time. God wanted to bring change to Nineveh, dependent on how they responded to their test, and Nineveh chose to respond in faith. They had no assurance that their repentance would stay God's judgment. Yet the city humbled itself, fasted, put on sackcloth and sat in ashes from the king to the lowliest slave and turned from their wicked ways. That's the absolute crux of the matter, turning from your wicked ways. From God's perspective, they changed. When Jesus was asked for a sign, he pointed them to Jonah. Why? To share with them that unless they have the faith like the Ninevites, the outcome is death because the Nineveh chose to respond in faith, even though they had no assurance that their repentance would stay God's judgment. And their redemption is obtained only one way, through the blood of Messiah. Jesus pointed the Jews to the sign of Jonah, his resurrection after he died in the fish. Resurrection speaks of one thing, the reality of the kingdom, the reality of Almighty God, the reality of eternal life with Jesus. And Jesus pointed them at Jonah. Dr. Baruch Corman explains the following. God was willing to spare Nineveh, but in order to do that, he couldn't spare his own son. Somebody had to die for the city's sins, or they would die in their sins. Romans 8. 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all blessings? Jesus always did what pleased his father. John 8, Jesus says, And he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I'll always do those things that please him. Jesus used Jonah's ministry to Nineveh to show the Jews how guilty they were in rejecting Jesus' own message. Matthew 12, Jesus said, The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Jonah preached a message to just one city, yet Jesus, the Son of God, preached a message of grace and salvation for the entire world. Jonah rebelliously died for his own sins, yet Jesus willingly died for the sins of all. 1 John 2 My little children, these things are right to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jonah sat on a hillside outside the city to watch if God would kill the Ninevites. Yet on a hill outside Jerusalem, hanging on a cross, Jesus asked God to forgive those who killed him. Luke 23, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That love outstanding. Isn't it interesting that this is where the book ends? Jonah is the author of this book, and he admits without omission all his faults. So I like to think that Jonah did find compassion and grace in the end, because he's so honest about his faults. He must have come to an admission about the wickedness of his own heart, and that he was totally out of sync with God's heart. God could have picked any of his prophets to give the message, but he picked Jonah. Why? Because God knew there was an issue in Jonah's heart that needed resolving. Is there anybody in your life that if God saved them tonight and you heard about it, that you would be resentful that from now on they would thrive under the wings of the Almighty? Is there anybody that you don't want saved? God never runs out of pity for his children. He says, paraphrasing, And should I not pity London or New York or Beijing? Because of the millions of innocents, God delays. And he has delayed for nearly 2,000 years now. God has pity on mankind and has delayed his son's second coming to give as many as possible time to meet Jesus and get saved. So I was looking at this picture of the most populated cities in the world. Of course, Tokyo, 28 million, De- Delhi, 23 million, etc. And I was looking for America. There isn't any city in America. So we're not even in these upper cities. And so New York, I looked it up, has got 8 million. And LA, which I thought would have, has got 3 million. Um, of course, this is not counting all the illegals that have poured into the country in the last few years. Let's look at this. And that's just the most populated cities, and there are hundreds, thousands of cities. So the reason that the cross took place is because judgment is real. Hell is real. Jesus said so. Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. In Matthew 8, Jesus said, But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into utter darkness. They will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the book of Revelation tells us that there will come a day when time is up, and the human race is called to a reckoning with God. When we throw out the concept of judgment, we are tossing out the meaning of the cross. If there's no judgment, then why did Jesus have to go through that horror? God is a great God. This is a book about God. 1 John 4 says, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is God's love that we read about in Jonah. John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And what happened to Jonah? 
We know he made it back to Israel, where he eventually died and was buried in Nazareth. Jonah, Amos, and Hosea were all contemporaries, all preaching to the northern kingdom that the stench of Israel's sins had similarly reached heaven. Israel's idolatry was as bad as Nineveh's. Their worship of God was a mix of paganism and Jewish rituals of feasts and festivals. The nation Israel was an offense to the one true God, and they ignored the warnings of their own prophets. Nineveh instantly repented. Here God has sent three, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea, and they ignored all their warnings. In 722 BC, nearly 40 years later, the next generation of Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom and the people of Israel taken into captivity. The Assyrian policy was to spread their captives throughout their empire, which effectively destroyed their culture. This, in turn, reduced the chances of a captive nation rebelling because they were no longer a cohesive nation. They were scattered throughout the empire. And the northern kingdom disappears as an ethnic entity. So Jonah couldn't see that Israel was as wicked as Nineveh. Interesting. And what happened to Nineveh? Nineveh was the flourishing capital of the Assyrian Empire. In biblical times, it was famous because it was a center for the pagan worship of Ishtar, Ashtati, the goddess, the fertility goddess. And Ishtar and uh, Ashtati were famous for their spiky crown. Whenever you see them depicted, they have this spiky crown, a goddess, a pagan goddess. What does that remind you of? The city of Nineveh stretched along the Tigris River for some 30 miles and stretched back about 10 miles from the riverbank. A huge city, easily as big as one of our major cities today. Millions of people there. One advancement from Nineveh that we still use today is the lock and key invented in Assyria. The king himself said they were a criminal society, so it's easy to see why they invented a locking mechanism. And today we too lock our homes and cars when we leave. Nineveh also had paved roads long before the Romans had roads. They also had libraries, a postal system, flushing toilets and plumbing. Yet the Ninevites didn't immediately sink back into evil. It took some time. It was about a hundred years before God sent yet another prophet, Nahum, to warn Nineveh once again that their time extension was finally up. The entire Nahum chapter 3 tells of the woe of Nineveh. In 612 BC, Assyria falls to a joint army of the Medes, Scythians, and Babylonians. The famous city was never rebuilt. This ends the Assyrian Empire, but they didn't disappear. They were simply ruled by others. Assyrians were some of the first converts by the early Christian church. They had a thriving Christian community that sent missionaries to convert other eastern areas. So Jonah did have enormous impact. So the ten miracles of Jonah, storm, God creates a storm. They throw lots and it falls on Jonah as the guilty person. And when they throw him overboard, there's a sudden subsiding of the storm. Then a great fish comes along at the right time in the right place and swallows him. And uh, there's the preservation of Jonah when he cries out from Hades. And he's ejected from the fish safe and sound on dry land. And then chapter 3, with the previous chapter, we had the repentance of the entire city of Nineveh, which was the biggest miracle, I think, of all. And in this chapter 4, we have the bird, the plant that grew up, the worm that ate it, and the east wind that makes Jonah's life really uncomfortable. So I, I, you may be wondering why I've got this picture here, because I wanted to point out that this sudden subsiding of the storm, I have personally seen that in my life. I had my boat up in the San Francisco Bay, and I wanted to bring it back down to to Long Beach over here. Yes, LA, and you have to go around the point to Long Beach. And so this is about a three or four day journey if you're sailing, depending on the strength of the wind. So when we set off, my son and my grandson, my 10 year old grandson came to say goodbye, um, and then they were gonna drive back to LA. And I asked my 10 year old grandson, Samuel, to please pray over grandma in the boat. So he prayed, and at the last minute I said, and ask for flat seas. So Samuel tacked it onto his little prayer. Please give Omar flat seas. Amen. And off they went. And I had hired a skipper because I was sailing alone. And you're not allowed to really do that in this very, very busy shipping lanes here. So I'd hired a skipper to help me go for the four days. And we left San Francisco and we started heading down. And as we were heading down, 
the news started coming over the VHF radio that there was massive storms in the Pacific, huge storms, and they were roaring our way with huge waves. And they were saying it's highly dangerous. Now, I remembered um, some months before when one of the a boat came up from L.A. to San Francisco and docked next to me. And he was a beautiful boat, a huge, big 60-foot yacht, sailing yacht. And it had got caught in a storm and rolled repeatedly. And so it was really, really smashed up. By the time it arrived at, at the dock next to me, this boat was smashed up. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair it. So as we're going out and they're starting to talk about this huge storm out there, I'm worrying that maybe it's going to reach us before we can scoot down to Long Beach over here. So I said to the skipper as we went past Monterey and then we went past Morro Bay and it, the, the news by the time we got to Morro Bay was really, really bad of the storm. And, you know, gale force winds and huge, huge waves. And so uh, I contemplated turning in at Morro Bay. But the skipper said, no, he didn't think it would be that bad. Plus, of course, he was scheduled. I'd only booked him for four days, and he was scheduled on day five to go off to some other boat. So he wanted to keep going. So when we got to, uh, as we're now heading, this is down to Santa Barbara down here. There's Point Conception, where's where the other boat got rolled. That boat I was talking about got rolled. And you can see it's very shallow near the coast, very, very shallow. So what happens is uh, when there's a bad storm, these huge waves come in from from the sea there's there's no there's no land here in the pacific so the wind can build up really great force um and and so can the waves because there's nothing to interrupt them it's just open sea there by the time they hit point conception this is a cliff and it's very shallow so these huge waves come in and then crash into the cliff and go back and so you get this maelstrom turbulent massive turbulent seas right here which is where he got rolled and this is what we're heading for now, as the news got worse and worse and worse. So we're four hours away from 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 uh, Point Conception when um, when I was I had come off my watch and I was, I was downstairs. And before I got into bed, I prayed and I said to God, talking about the sudden subsiding of the storm. I prayed and I said to God. You know, I'm looking at you. We're already being thrown around in the sea. We're already, we've, we've come as far off from the coast as we can because the sea is so bad and we've been tossed around. And I prayed and I said, God, I'm looking out at these masses of waves and this howling wind. And I'm thinking, maybe, maybe it's tough for you, God, to bring down these huge, huge waves down to nothing like with Jonah. But if you could bring them down to three foot waves, then then that would be better. A three foot wave hitting this co this cliff and coming back would be better than a 15, 20 foot wave. So as I go to bed, I let off a heartfelt prayer. Please, God, won't you please just try and get the wave done? I know flat seas is is asking a lot, but a three foot wave would be good for me. So I go to sleep. Four hours later, I wake up and now I'm going to be in control of the boat going around Point Conception. The news also said, do not go into the Santa Barbara Channel. And this is usually very calm because, look, here's all these islands. So they stop high winds and high waves from coming in here. So the Santa Barbara Channel is usually very calm. Um, and the news, as we were coming down, was saying, don't even go into the Santa Barbara Channel because it's, it's just a maelstrom of waves and wind, and it's just a mess down there. So don't, try and stay out to sea and come around this way in, into Long Beach. So I go to sleep. And when I woke up, my alarm went off and I went upstairs. And here's the skipper. And I'm expecting to find the skipper running around, adjusting the sails, you know, just saving us from this massive storm when I go up. And I get up and I look outside and, and here's the skipper. He's sitting there casually reading a book. And he looked up as I came out and he could see the stunned look on my face. And he smiled and he pointed out at the sea. And I looked out and the sea was flat. It was flat like a lake. There was no wind. We were motoring along because there was no wind and no sea. It was flat like a lake. And I stared at him and he just grinned. And I did a 360 and I looked all around. There was no waves. It was flat, flat, flat. And I just burst out laughing. And I could see me saying to God, maybe you can't flatten the waves a lot because they're really bad. But if you could flatten them to three foot, I'd appreciate it. And God said, you little shrimp. 
You think I don't control the wind and the waves? I'll show you. And he killed the wind completely so that we had to motor and the sea was flat like a lake. So when this happened, when they threw Jonah overboard, this happened while I was asleep and uh, much to the amusement of the skipper. So we came around point, a point concept. We came, uh, we came through the Santa Barbara Channel, which was flat as a pancake as well, and into Long Beach with absolutely no, uh, no terror at all. Because the sea is when it's mighty, man. That's when you realise how insignificant you are. So I can, I can feel pity for these sailors that were looking at this massive storm. They were right in it. At least by the time I woke up, I wasn't in it. But they were right in it. And God flattened the sea for them. And God flattened the sea for me. God is a miracle God. So that's the end. Episode 5, Chapter 4. Jonah is angry, but God is mercy. So for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Psalms 95, 3. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. Daniel 9, 9. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Psalm 103, 8. And I love this. Somebody's made a heart. God is good. God is great, exalted, generous, awesome, wonderful, astonishing, powerful. Isn't that beautiful? Somebody took the trouble to do that. So our God is a great God, a big God, and he holds us in his hands. Remember as kids we used to sing that song? He's got the whole world in his hands. I remember that song as a kid. And I remember this one. This this thing or this chapter of Jonah is all about God's faithfulness. And I remember my mother when as kids, whenever we came into the house, we didn't have to say, Mom, where are you? Because we could hear her singing. My mother sang Christian songs all the time. All the time. She sang us to sleep, she sang us awake, she sang us while we bathed. Uh, and so when we came running in the house we, we just followed the sound of my mother singing. And she used to love the song, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. This was my mother sang the song all the time. She was always singing. So thank you for sitting through four chapters of Jonah with me. Before you go, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Shalom.